illustrates the point. There was a church and the, the new pastor, on the first Sunday he was there, dressed up as a homeless person, put tattoos on his ha- fake tattoos on his hands, and sat at the front of the door of the church with a pot asking for money as people came through the doors. Only about two or three people spoke to him of the 200 plus that were members of that church. The rest of the people avoided him. Then, at the start of the service, he came up to the front and introduced himself as the pastor and said, clearly there is work to do in this church. (laughs) That story, whether it's true or not, is the sort of thing that shows just how bad the church can be at showing favoritism to a certain type of people. In that situation, the church were clearly not concerned about the homeless person. Now, you could say it's not a good start for the pastor to trick the congregation, but I think it proves the point. But what are we like in the church in the West in 2024 at showing favoritism to certain types of people? Do we always choose to sit and talk with those who are like us? Or are we willing to reach out And speak to someone who perhaps we wouldn't normally associate ourselves with. We're very good at looking after our own within the church. But how good are we at looking after the needs of the community out there? Friends, quite bluntly, the church has got it wrong. The church has got it so wrong. I visited a church once and I was treated like absolute royalty. I wasn't allowed to carry my own bag. I wasn't allowed to to wait at the door. I had to be escorted through. I was taken to the front of the church. I was sat on a seat, which was a different seat to the rest of the congregation. It had a special cover on it. And I was told, in many ways, it felt like they were worshipping the pastor, worshipping me. And I didn't like it. It was very, very uncomfortable. Because I am not here to be served by you. I am here to serve you by doing what I believe the Lord is calling me to do in this time, in this season, for this church, for as long as that may be. It was uncomfortable because it reminded me of those words that were read to us today in James 2. It reminds us once again, the church is not about ourselves. It is not about getting out of church what we want. It's about coming together as a family And serving one another as a foretaste of that heavenly banquet when we finally get there. James is once again challenging us without mincing his words. I like to think he's a bit of a northerner because he's very direct and blunt. And I like to be direct and blunt sometimes. David spoke last week about not allowing the world to influence us. James continues here by reminding us that the world is constantly assessing people. It is constantly sizing them up. It is constantly putting them down. And it is constantly trying to establish a pecking order. Where do you fit in society? Are you one of the elite or are you right at the bottom? Or are you somewhere in between? Because society says it's about power, it's about wealth. We idolize the celebrities. We idolize those that have the perfect body. We idolize the things that are wrong with the world. And that is creeping in to the church. Because for too long, the church has done just the same. In the early church, some places had a rule that if a regular member of the congregation arrived, an usher would show them to their seat. But if a stranger came in, the bishop, who was usually sat on his seat, would leave his chair, go to the door, and welcome the newcomer in. That takes courage. That takes guts. But that is what the church should be like. That we welcome in those who are new. We welcome those who are different to us. We celebrate the fact that we are gathering together as a family in the church. Friends, we are a church that wants to grow. Or at least I hope we are. We are a church that has grown in number in the last few years. But have we truly grown in respecting and loving one another? I think that one has taken a long time, and I think there is still work to do on it in the coming weeks and months ahead. In fact, I think we'll be continually doing that till the end of time. 
Because we are human, we will get it wrong, and we will continue to get it wrong. But we can try. We're hoping to reach out in mission to our community. We want to speak about Jesus to those who don't yet know him. But I wonder, as we do that, as it brings new people into the church, are we willing to adapt and change our ways? Or are we going to expect them to conform to the way that we do things? Because we're comfortable with it. There comes a point when we have to acknowledge that we need to shake things up. We need to not be defined by our roles, but we need to be defined by Jesus himself. Because that is our primary calling. I'm going to split the reading down into four today. So firstly, our culture is sick and dangerous. When we first read James, we need to remember the context of the Roman world to which James is first here as we're living through. It was a culture that prided itself on social significance and wealth. The wealthy would put on displays of significance which required the poor to go and honor the wealthy. Think of Pilate's entrance to Jerusalem on that day, on on Palm Sunday, at the opposite side of the city. The difference that it was to Jesus' entry into the city. And in the reading, it was a strong call to avoid those aspects of Roman culture. Because James is essentially saying, There needs to be an opposition to the spirit of the world and and an opposition of the spirit of self-interest. Now take out the Roman stuff. That could apply to 2024. We pride, we, we look up to those who are significant as the world defines them. We think of those who are wealthy. Often, when, when celebrities are there, people will gather around in crowds to go and see them, and perhaps not quite, perhaps honor them, but to go, I got a glimpse of so-and-so. Isn't it amazing? We need to have a long, hard look at current culture. We need to have a long, hard look at the continuing push towards a secular society, and a continuing push of society wanting to push Christianity out of the public sphere. It is time that Christianity gets right back into the midst of the public sphere. After all, our country is based and built on Christian principles. When we look at the Magna Carta, we are built on Christian principles, and it's time we got back to that. But to do that, we have to first take a long, hard look at ourselves. Culture has infiltrated the church. We know that the church is being swayed by it. We see more of what is culturally acceptable happening in the church, even if it goes against the word of God. Yet, yet, we cannot condemn culture totally. Because if we do, we isolate ourselves and we cut ourselves off from everybody out there. And then we just feel like we're a nice little holy happy bubble. And then we're not relevant to society. We have to go out Because James is not calling us to be a a church where we're closed off. James is calling us to be God's ambassadors to the world and to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Are we up for that? Not really. That's better. Two are. We also have to be careful that we're not condemning the world in all that is taking place. We have to take a stance on the big issues facing culture at the moment. We have to stand up for the big issues facing the church at the moment, even if it makes it a lonely place to be. But we also have to be aware of the subtle ways that culture creeps into the church and begins to shape the church into something that does not reflect Jesus Christ. If we take an honest look at the church... In many ways, we've become too nice to each other. We allow things to happen that shouldn't. The Word of God tells us to use it to admonish our brothers and sisters when we stray. Why are we so nice? That's not to say go out for coffee and start telling each other off. But too often in the church, we allow things to go unchallenged because we want to be nice and we don't want to offend anyone. Well, guess what? That's what's happening in society. I think this is true, but I don't want to offend you. So if you think different, that's okay. That cannot be in the church. Because we have the truth. 
We live on the truth. We are built on the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. It's a difficult place to be, though. But we need to wake up to the way we allow these things to creep into the church. We, friends, have to model truth to society. The truth that is Jesus Christ. We have to act upon his word without changing or bending it to make it fit our present-day culture. Otherwise, culture creeps in and Jesus is slowly eradicated from the church. Secondly, cultural influence is not always what we expect. As I've said, it can be subtle and creep in when we at least expect it. We know that the enemy prowls round like a roaring lion and that cultural influence is one of the ways this happens. Christianity in the 21st century has become too consumeristic. It's all about church should make you feel good. I want to get out of church what I want. We create environments that are comfortable, non-threatening and familiar. Now that in itself is not a bad thing. We need to be comfortable and non-threatening. But we also have to be uncomfortable. Because Jesus calls us to get out of the boat. James tells us to live the life of a disciple, which will mean doing those things which make us unpopular. It will mean putting our head above the parapet and making a stand against culture. We may be ostracized for it, but does that matter? No. Because we are building our lives in the church upon the person of Jesus Christ. The danger comes into the church when we start only wanting certain songs to be played. Or we catch ourselves leaving and thinking, I did nothing for me this morning. I don't like the color of the chair. I don't like the color of the paint. I don't like what we're doing. I don't like the book of James. It's too hard. Tough. (laughs) Tough. (laughs) Too often we dismiss the things of God because it doesn't give us what we wanted. But actually God is giving us what we need. And needs and wants are very different. Think about the last film that you watched. At the end, perhaps you would go and talk to whoever you watched it with or text somebody and go, I enjoyed that film. Perhaps you say, I didn't enjoy it. And if you don't enjoy it, you wouldn't watch it again. When we start thinking about the church being for us, about whether we're enjoying it or not, we border into consumer Christianity. And we have to avoid that. We want things run our way. We want the church to be what we want. No. The church is not about us. The church is about Jesus Christ. It's somewhere where Christ is glorified. Society and culture have lost the whole idea of authenticity. But in the church, we need to model what authentic disciples look like. We need to be authentic disciples of Jesus Christ because then we can make a difference. I'm stood here today talking about the scriptures because I want to be authentic in my walk as a disciple. I want to be authentic in following the calling that God has put on my life. If I am not living my Christian life in an authentic way, I'm a fraud. And friends, I'm not a fraud. I share with you when I get things wrong. I will hold my hand up when I get things wrong. I want to be accountable for my actions. I know that as a public person, as a public figure, people are always looking for ways to discredit me. I know that that's just what it is. Yet I know I'm not perfect. I know I sin, and I know I fall short of the glory of God. But when I step out of line, and I do, I always try to make amends. That is an authentic disciple of Christ. If I was to tell you I've got it all sorted, nothing ever goes wrong, I'm kidding myself, and I'm kidding you, and it wouldn't be authentic. Cultural influence slips in and sneaks in when we start to cherry-pick parts of Scripture which make us relevant. It's not compassionate, friends, to treat what the Bible calls as sin as anything less than that. The Bible tells us it's sin, therefore it is sin, end of. It is not compassionate to go, but it's okay for that little bit. Such truth, the biblical truth, is not warmly endorsed by culture. It's usually vilified or rejected, but so was Jesus Christ. 
so will we be if we are true and authentic disciples. We cannot make our decisions based on cultural standards. We can only make our decisions based on biblical truth, even if it makes us unpopular. Because we cannot allow cultural influence to sneak its way into the church. So culture, outside, what about if we turn the camera the other way and look at ourselves? The problem of favoritism in the church. We're very guilty of that. There's a danger in the church that people feel they can have a significant influence on how things are run. Perhaps it's, well, I give a lot of money, so I have more influence in what goes on. That's one of the main reasons. I don't know how much any of you give. I don't want to know. It's not for me to know. It's between you and the Lord. Within the church, we have to honor each and every person. I don't want to be in a church that puts its leader on a pedestal and is treated like royalty. Because that's not what Jesus is saying to the church. I dislike the fact that in the church we have a hierarchy and we refer to people by their title and not their name. Yes, bishop, no bishop, three bags full bishop. What makes them any different apart from their consecration? Why are they not known by their first names? Because we're making a hierarchy that is setting us into culture and not the people like Jesus and they're not the church of Jesus Christ. Do we dismiss the homeless person sitting at the back when they try and speak to us about Jesus? Because, well, they're homeless. They don't have anything to share with us. Or do we listen to them? Do we hear what they're saying? Do we take it on board? Do we only like people who, at the front who speak with a certain accent? Sorry, folks, I'm a Yorkshireman. I'm always going to speak with a northern accent. Do we judge someone by their clothes? Do we show favoritism because somebody wears the same brand of clothing as us? Do we allow wealth to influence our favoritism? James isn't against wealth. He is against, what he is against, though, is that the church becoming an arena for the display of wealth used to enhance our status. Naming church facilities after a donor, naming things after such displays would make James nervous or even angry. And it should do to us as well. James is basing his teaching on Jesus in Matthew 6. When you give, do it in secret. That's one example of favoritism. He's looking at how much wealth and how much people give. But there are so many other examples I could go through. But I don't want to keep you too long. Lastly, James teaches us about a holistic model of church life. James was facing a situation in the church where the self-indulgent attitude of some of the members threatened to create not a community of compassion, but one of social privilege and status. James's teaching is looking to re-establish the necessary conditions for the church to be a community of compassion. He calls this, in verse 12, the law that gives freedom. As I've mentioned earlier, within the church, we're often too nice to one another. We don't challenge those things which are inappropriate. Now, that's not to say I'm expecting all of us to now form an orderly queue and share all of our dirty laundry before each of us this morning. No, I'm not going to ask you to do that. But there does have to be an element of us being open and honest with one another. Because often within the church, when we feel conflict is getting close, we shy away from it and we hope it'll all be okay. No, it's not. We hope things will get better. What if we're afraid of sharing something in the church about what's going on in our lives for fear of being ostracized? For fear of somebody saying, oh, well, in that case, I don't want to know you. No. In the church, we are a family. We need to be honest and open with one another. If something is going on that we're afraid of, share it. Ask for support. Ask for guidance. Ask for prayer. Be accountable to one another, and then we will see the church become the community of, com of compassion that James is talking about. It's not simply enough for us to remain in the church. Our faith encourages us to be transformed from the inside out, and therefore our deeds and how we think or act become more in line with who Jesus is. Our churches are no longer a place of sanctuary. They're a place where we have to put up barriers to protect ourselves. 
How are you? I'm fine. When clearly you're not. Now, that's not to say you have to share it. But why can you say, actually, no, there's stuff going on in my life at the moment. It's, it's a bit tricky. That's all you need to share. What if the church can actually become the place where we can all thrive and grow spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually? What if we substitute that niceness that we have in the church in the West for honesty and being honest and accountable with one another? When James rebuked the church, it was because he was a brother, not because he was a judge or a superior, but because he had compassion on those in the church and wanted the best for them. Do we want what's best for our brothers and sisters in the church, or do we want what's best for us? So the question that's left for us, do we want to be a church that is addressing the needs of the community, or do we want to be a church that is addressing our own needs and catering for ourselves? Are we teaching biblical principles for living and speaking out against anything in society that is against the word of God? Are we passionate about the need for those who are lost to come to know Jesus Christ? Are we going to take those words penned by James seriously? Or are we just going to listen to them on a Sunday and forget about them when we walk out of that door? James tells us that his call against favoritism and to live by the law that brings freedom. Jesus modeled such a life. James preserves this model, and this call is to be found faithful to Scripture, be found living upon biblical principles, to be found out in our community, serving those in need, and be in a church that reflects the glory of Jesus in all that we do. That's a big challenge. James doesn't mince his words. I don't think I've minced many words this morning. Are you up for the challenge to be a church? That's a community of compassion built on Jesus Christ. Are we comfortable being a church which suits our own needs? Amen. Am I on? Okay.